Welcome to the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast. I'm Mike Waters. Today, ESPN broadcaster Jay Billis joins the podcast. Billis played for Mike Krzyzewski at Duke. He is now one of ESPN's premier analysts and also one of the most respected voices in college athletics. But if that's all you know about Jay Billis, then you don't know half the story. Did you know that Jim Beheim once recruited him to play at Syracuse and he even took a campus visit? Or that he had a role in the TV show, The White Shadow? Listen in as Jay shares some incredible stories. We're joined here on the Syracuse Basketball Podcast by not uh, a Syracuse basketball player or a coach, uh, but one of the most esteemed voices in all of college basketball, uh, ESPN broadcaster Jay Billis. Jay, how are you? I'm good, Mike. How you doing? Well, we're all hanging in there these days, uh, working from home and, and hoping that eventually we get to cover some basketball this winter. How about yourself? Yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful as well. Uh, you know, all of our rhythms have been off and, and look, you know, there are people having a lot, a lot worse than we do. It's affected everybody in, in some way, but uh, uh, I'm cautiously optimistic, but I'm expecting a, a bumpy ride to get to, uh, to March. So um, let's keep our fingers crossed. I know everybody's doing everything they can, but, but there are days where you read the news, you know, you're looking at the news going, I don't know how this is going to happen, but, uh, but it seems like everybody's doing, doing everything they can. I'll probably ask you a few more questions about that in the, in the upcoming season and what is going to have to happen. But first of all, we have to clear one hurdle. It's a Syracuse basketball podcast and you didn't play or go to Syracuse. However, you were recruited by Syracuse, weren't you? Yeah, I think I hold the distinction of being the first player from California that Jim Beheim ever recruited. And, uh, and Jim likes to, when, when that stat is, uh, or that factoid is, is provided, he said, you know, he always says that, yeah, and after we found out we could, we could get a player from California, we started going out to recruit the good players. And, uh, but, but yeah, it was 1981. Um, you know, Bernie Fine uh, uh, was the first one to contact me, and uh, and I had an interest, um, and then visited Syracuse uh, in October of '81, and I was very close to to going there. Um, it was a, uh, I was choosing among coaches, not schools, and I know people don't like to hear that in within the NCAA structure. You know, they think that the choice is made on academic programs and all that, and it wasn't, but the or for me it wasn't, but uh, it, it's funny, Mike, like, so the, la- the four coaches I came down to were Coach K, Jim Beheim, Lute Olson, who was at Iowa at the time, and Ted Owens, who was at Kansas. And uh, all of those coaches have coached in the Final Four multiple times, and three of them are in the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. That's, uh, I, I, I was pretty good at choosing coaches. That, that, was, that wasn't bad, bad lineup. One could argue they were you were better at scouting coaches than they were at scouting players. <laughs> that's that's true, that's true. Like Coach K says, he would have gotten in the Hall of Fame earlier if I'd chosen one of the other guys. <laughs> and then I listen. In all fairness, you scored over a thousand points at Duke. Well, we can't. Yeah, I mean, I was a good player. I was a good player. I'm not. You know, I mean, I I, I have no illusion that I was a great uh, player, but I was a I was a uh, I think I would. I was like a top 40 high school player uh, in the country. And, uh, and, you know, like I chose a place where we had the same roles for four years, which is unusual. It's unusual. You're going to, you're to be on a team where, you know, the role that you play is going to be exactly the same every year because we came in, we were all freshmen, we all stayed. And uh, so there was, you know, there, there was no opportunity to break out of that role uh, because of the other, the other players you were with. And so for me, uh, the, one of the great parts of my, um, my basketball life was being able to, you know, you're a star in high school, you're a role player in college. And, you know, I was a good player. But then when I went, uh, I got drafted and I, I, I wound up taking a contract to play in Italy. And I played, you know, I, I went to being a star player again, uh, you know, where you're the, the leading scorer, one of the leading scorers in the league, leading re- rebounder, all that stuff. And then I wound up playing. One of my teammates was Leo Robbins who is still one of my, my good friends to this day. So it's got a lot of Syracuse connections there. You mentioned Leo. If you visited Syracuse in October of 81, Leo was here. Did you, yes. did you meet him on the visit? No, uh, not on the visit. Um, Leo had gone home, I think, that weekend. 
So I wound up uh, staying with uh, with Sonny Spera and uh, and Sean Karens, and I, I stay in touch with Sonny to this day. Um, and uh, and every once in a while, I run into Sean on the road, who's a great guy. But Andre Hawkins is on the team, and and you know uh, Red Bruin and uh, all those Eric Sanifer. Um, it was a great group of of players. And this probably violated NCAA rule, but I think the statute of limitations passed. But I, I played pickup with those guys in Manly. So, uh, you know, so I, I was there. My dad went with me. And the reason my dad went was uh, he knew how much I liked Syracuse. And, uh, and he wanted to see it so that he could say, hey, you need to back off a little bit. Like, are you, how, how do you think you're going to do in that sort of weather? Uh, some of the other players, you know, like he, he thought – he really liked Bayheim and really liked Syracuse, but he, he wasn't sure that that was the right place for me. And, uh, and after I froze my, uh, my tail off in October being there, um, I, I sort of got a taste of, wait a minute, it, it's going to get colder than this, uh, you know, because I was a little weather wimp from, from Los Angeles that, uh, that, that, that I thought 50 degrees was, uh, you know, cataclysmic, uh, you know, cold. Now, you mentioned you're from Southern California. You went to Rolling Hills High School. Mm -hmm. But I happen to know that that's not the only high school you played for, in air quotes. Oh, you, yeah. You played for Oak Ridge High School, right? You want to take me through this or you want to have me do it for you? No, I can help you. So, uh, <laughs> 1979, uh, I was a rising sophomore in, or a sophomore in high school. So one of my teammates and one of my friends from the time I we were teammates from fourth grade all the way through our senior year in high school, uh, his name is Matt Baker. And his dad, Dick Baker, was a, a college basketball coach and was an actor. And back then, you could turn on almost any show and you could see Dick Baker in it. Um, uh, he, was, he was like a, always an, ec like a, they called him extras, but he acted in like the $6 million man and Mannix and all these, all these unbelievable things. Well, he was the technical consultant for a, uh, one of the hottest shows on television back then called the white shadow. One of my and favorite shows be, of all time. Yeah. I mean, you have to be of a certain age for that, but that was a huge TV show. Uh, if I remember right, it was a CB you know, on CBS, but he, um, Dick Baker, uh, got us on that show as an opposing team to Carver high school. So we were, we were the, the team and somehow I, I was, uh, I was a guy that, that, uh, I wound up having, um, a role in that where I was on a little bit more like the opening scene of the show was, was our team the the, the opposing team to Carver where a Carver player transferred. Um, we were walking in after getting beat, walking into the locker room and, and, I got screamed, I got yelled at and humiliated by the coach. That was the opening of the show. And I was like, well, that was foreshadowing for the rest of my basketball career. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was, like, that was the first, sort of the first thing I ever did in, in, uh, in acting was, uh, was uh, w w my basketball team, all my buddies, we were extras on uh, The White Shadow. Well, I've seen that episode and you were snubbed for the Emmy, uh, Emmy Awards. I mean, you really you know, my sympathies go out. It was one of like the biggest fiascos in all time in Hollywood history. It's been a consistent theme because later on the Academy did it to me for a movie I was in. And then, uh, you know, it's, it's been a consistent theme where, where award shows have left me at the altar. You were in a movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, after, so after I got out of college, um, I start, I got a phone call when I was playing over season and uh or i just gotten back from my first year playing overseas i got a phone call from somebody in the front office of the lakers uh which was you know they're headquartered in england california about 15 20 minutes from my house or my parents house and my uh and, and he said hey listen there, there's a, a minolta camera commercial that's going to be shooting here in la and they're looking for six eight uh white guys to to be basketball players in the in the commercial and i thought i thought you might be interested in that and, and I was thinking, oh, how cool is that? That'd be great, you know, make a couple bucks, have some fun. So I, I figured I'm getting, a, I'm getting a phone call about this, so I must have it. I mean, that's awesome. And I went to the audition and there were 50 or 60 guys look just like me. 
you know, there. And I'm like, okay, well, this was a total screw job. I'm, I'm, what a joke. I'm not getting this. So I read for the part and, uh, and my mom actually drove me there. I was 20, you know, 23 years old. My mother's driving me to an audition, <laughs> but, um, we, we were walking out to the parking lot and somebody, uh, that was, you know, on the leadership crew of the, of casting this commercial, one of the casting agents came out and said, Hey, we didn't want to say this in front of everybody else, but we want you to come back for a callback. So, you know, such and such a time and date and we exchanged some information. And then I wound up, um, I wound up getting the part. So we filmed this commercial in Southern California and during a, a break, one of the camera guys was a uh, basketball fan. So we were talking and he said, Hey, who's your agent? And I told him, well, it's Larry Fleischer. And, uh, you know, and, and he says, who is Larry Fleischer? I've never heard of him. And I said, well, he That's represents crazy. Magic Johnson. Some of these, yeah, he's a basketball agent and was in the back. He's in the basketball hall of fame. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was later the uh, head of the players association uh, council and all that. He and David Stern were best friends. And uh, so he said, uh, the guy says, well, no, no, no. Who's your theatrical agent? I'm going, I don't have a theatrical agent. What are you talking about? He goes, you need an agent. You can make a lot of money doing this. He says, do you realize how, how much money there is in commercials? And, and he says, you can get into the Screen Actors Guild because you've already had a job. You know, the Taft-Hartley Act will get you in. So I, I listened to him. I went and got an agent. It wasn't that hard. Uh, and my agent, I got other commercials. And then the agent says to me, have you ever done any acting? I said, well, I was in a school play once, you know, and I, and I was on The White Shadow. That was pretty big. Yeah, there you go. And he, yeah, so he says, uh, well, let me send you on a couple of auditions and see, see if you like the process. And if you do, we'll send you on some more. So he sends me on this thing, and I read for a part in, a, in an action movie that Dolph Lundgren was starring in. And uh, I was, you know, I read for, for the part of an alien police officer, like a, 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 an otherworldly alien, you know, out of, you know, uh, interplanetary. And I wound up getting the part after. A Sounds like typecasting to me, Jay. Exactly. exactly. And I wound up dying in the movie. My death scene was very moving. Uh, and I think there were a lot of, there was not a dry eye for anybody who saw the movie. It actually was just on. It's been playing on uh, Showtime or HBO or something. I just saw it the other night. Uh, I didn't watch it, but I saw that it was on. I was going, you know, okay, there's another, there's another sense and residuals I'll get out of that. That's pretty good. And, and for those out there who have been dying to know so they can look it up, Dark Angel. Right? That was the original title. So it, it's it, Dark Angel was the original title and that's what it is overseas in the overseas market. But at the time there was another movie coming out called Dark Man. And so they changed the title to uh, of, of our movie to a line that one of the aliens had right before he killed you, which being "I come in peace." And uh, and I come in peace. Okay, all right. Well, we, let's transition back to basketball a little bit, if we can. Um, you mentioned playing in Italy, and you mentioned Leo, Leo Routens. You you guys were teammates over in Italy. What for? What team? And for how long? We played for for a team in Verona, Italy, and uh, uh, so that was my first year over there. Leo had been playing; he played for Banco Roma the year before, two years before that. So he he had experience playing in Italy, and so uh, what wound up happening was one uh, my back then you can only have two foreigners per team, and the rest of the the rest of the team was made up of of naturalized Italians, and and so. Uh, it was really competitive for jobs. So th this team uh, had cut uh, the other American and brought in Leo. So Le Leo came in uh, not quite a little more than mid-season, mm -hmm. and and I was I was really happy, but I wasn't happy to see a friend get cut. Um, but but you know since that happened, I was really happy it was Leo that was coming in, and because you know we knew each other, and and so uh, the first Leo got in, and then we went to dinner. Uh, one of either the first night or one of the first nights that he was there and uh, uh, it, that he had arrived. And he, so at dinner, he tells me, he says, now, you probably already know this, but, but I'm a great passer, like a great passer. If you get open, and how great is this? You know, you don't have a lot of guards tell you that. 
So uh, next, first game, Leo probably shot it 30 times. <laughs> and, uh, and, out, and he scored 40 points. But after the game, I was like, what happened to this great passer thing? <laughs> like, like I, you know, you, you shot it every time you touched it. And then he goes, well, part of being a, a great point guard is knowing the limitations of your teammates. And uh, I always thought that was a that was a pretty good pretty good response. But we had a great time. I used to go to uh, go over to his house all the time. Uh, you know, he was married to a woman named Maria at the time, and and uh, had uh, had young kids. Uh, so it was it was really fun. It was great. Uh, he's so good to me, and and has been ever since. And, and he's been a, a great influence on me. Was one of those young kids named Andy? Yes. Absolutely. Very young. And what, what I would do, I, you know, they're, they're, his kids are too young to remember this, but I would always bring candy in my jacket pocket. And, and that way, uh, it's a, uh, I, was, I was the most popular guy in the house when I'd come over. Uncle Jay. So, all right. So despite this burgeoning uh, acting career, uh, when your playing career ends, instead of going to Hollywood, you go back to Durham. You went back to Duke, right? You, you, you were on Coach K's staff for, uh, what, two or three years? Three years, yeah. Um, after my third year that? overseas, uh, I'd had enough. Well, you know, I'd always, my, my, my parents had kind of always encouraged me that I needed to go to law school, that, that having an undergraduate degree was not going to be enough for me, uh, that no matter what I wanted to do, I had to have something substantial to fall back on. And my dad especially was like, look, if you played 10, 12 years over in Europe, you're never going to do anything else. And, and uh, so you need, to, you need to take the LSAT and get admitted to a law school somewhere, and then you could defer it and play as long as you want. But if you're going to wait till you're 32 or, or 30 to go, uh, you know, take the LSAT, then you're going to have to wait a year to get into law school. He goes, come on, man, you're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And he was right. So I took the LSAT while I was in Europe. I took it at a, uh, my third year over there, I took it at an Air Force base, you know, kind of in November, December, whatever the month was, mm -hmm. and did well enough where I could get into law school. So I applied to Duke and was hopeful, on a, I mean, being completely frank, I was hopeful I wouldn't get in. And uh, ultimately, uh, through, you know, I think there was some, some people helping me out there, but ultimately I got in and, and then Coach K called me and said, uh, uh, hey, I've got an opening on my staff. Would you like to be a, a grad assistant while you're going to law school? And I was like, yeah, I think I would. And uh, so I did both at the same time. And, uh, and it was a great education, in both basketball and, and you know, the, the, law, the law degree. Three years at Duke as an assistant, they went to the Final Four every single year and won two titles. Clearly, you are the key to Coach K's success because he hasn't done anything since you left. Yeah, there's really, uh, you know, sort of the, the three in a row thing. There's really no other explanation than me. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, that staff, think about, the, so that staff, and I, I wasn't really, I, I was a grad assistant, so I was like a trainee, really, but. Okay. Um, that staff had Mike Bray and Tommy Amaker on it. And uh, so to get to learn from those guys every day, I mean, you know, Tommy has been a lifelong friend and, and teammate. We were teammates uh, for three years. He's a year behind me in school. And then to work together for, for three years. And then, you know, Mike Bray has been a profound influence on me. Uh, I used to sit in his office all the time and I learned so much from him because he had a different perspective. He wasn't, he didn't play for Coach K. So he was one of the few guys that called him Mike. You know, you didn't hear that, that term around very much. Uh, you know, it was always Coach and Coach K. And, and uh, I learned a ton from Mike and, and uh, have always been really grateful to him. So when you're done with, you know, your law school and, you, and you've graduated there, you don't stick around at Duke. You, you didn't stay in coaching. Why not? I got, I was getting married. So at the end of my, um, uh, in my last year, uh, I had gotten engaged. My wife and I, my wife now, Wendy, um, we, we were engaged in December of that year, I think, or maybe a little bit earlier, maybe it was November. But um, we, we had thought about uh, coaching, like I want to stay in coaching. And in talking about it, we kind of realized that 
if I stayed in coaching, even if I did incredibly well, which was a, it certainly wasn't a given, we're probably gonna have to move every five years, uh, at, at least initially. Um, and both Wendy and I had grown up in, in households where they were, we stayed in one place and we kind of wanted that for our family. So it was really a family decision. It wasn't necessarily what I wanted. It was, it was what, what's, what do we want? And, uh, and because I had gone to law school, um, I could do, I could jump in and get a job as a lawyer and sort of, we were going to start our, our family life that way. And, uh, so we, at first I was going to, I accepted a job out in Los Angeles with a big law firm. And th this is the one thing where, where my wife said, okay, I really don't want to go there. I'd rather live in, she wanted to live in Charlotte, North Carolina, and that's where we wound up. Okay. And it, it was the best thing for us. It's been great. But uh, I took a job as a lawyer with a big law firm in, in Charlotte, and uh, and I thought that's that's it, that's what I'm going to do. And the only way I got into broadcasting, honestly, was uh, I got a phone call, you know, about six months into my job, and uh, from a guy named George Hable, who was the president of the, something called the Capital Sports Network, and he said, uh, "We'd like you to do radio color commentary for us." And uh, and so I figured, all right, um, it was no money, uh, relatively like it was, it was a few bucks and expenses and that's it. And so I certainly wasn't doing it for the money, but I thought, you know what, if, if I don't like it, if it's too, too taxing on me and negatively affects my law practice, I'll quit. But I don't think I should quit before I try it. So I'm going to, I'm going to take it and uh, I don't want to quit before I start it. And so I took it and, and did well. And, Eventually, after a couple of years, somebody from ESPN gave me a call and said, hey, we want to offer you some games. And that's how that's how ESPN happened. That's cool. Now, I read one thing about your law career, and you got to tell me if this is true or not. You successfully defended a company against a trademark type of lawsuit from the company that owned Barney the Dinosaur? Yeah, um, I had, I practiced full time for about, seven, eight years, like, like really full time where I had a bunch of cases open at the same time. And I was there morning, noon and night every day. Okay. And, uh, and I had a lot of, I had a lot of what I consider to be big cases, important, you know, important cases, a lot of money on the line, uh, interesting issues. But the, the case that was the most famous and the one I heard most about from everybody, I defended a costume manufacturer in a trademark and copyright infringement lawsuit against uh, 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 that was brought by Lions Partnership, which owned Barney the Purple Dinosaur. And they contended that my client had been manufacturing and selling costumes that looked exactly like Barney. And the truth is that's exactly what was happening. They looked exactly <laughs> like Barney. And, uh, and they, they were just doing a sweep. They're just doing a nationwide sweep, which, which companies have to do to protect their trademark and copyright. Yeah, but, sure. I, get you know, it. I, I don't think I'm I don't think I'm stepping out of bounds by saying they took it too far against my client. They didn't like my client. They thought he was uh, uh, they didn't like him. So they decided they were going to make an example out of him for anybody else that might tread into that area. And they made it they made it impossible to settle the case that even if they won a trial, they would get less than they were asking in settlement. So we had no choice but to try it. And we tried the case in federal court in the Western District of North Carolina, and we won. Um, <laughs> now, which is just, we never contemplated winning, and we won. Oh. Uh, so it wound up going on appeal, and I had to argue uh, the case in front of the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is one step away from uh, the United States Supreme Court. And I'm, I'm there arguing Barney the Purple Dinosaur. Uh, so there's an element of it that was really cool, and then another element of it that was profoundly stupid and embarrassing. But um, but it was a great case, and and uh, and I'm really glad we won. It, 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 but we got some of it rolled back on appeal, which which should have happened. But um, but it was a really interesting interesting case. Intergalactic alien cop one, Barney the Dinosaur zero. And that actually came up, Mike, not, not the intergalactic cop thing, oh. but I had subpoenaed Barney to the trial that, that uh, the opposing counsel and, and the, the general counsel of, of the, the partnership had pissed me off so much. They had jerked us around like you wouldn't believe. And so I said, <laughs> all right, well, I'm subpoenaing Bar Barney to the trial. And they fought it. 
Really? So, so we had, a, yeah, we had a motion before before Judge Graham Mullen in in the Western District uh, in Charlotte, and uh, and so we're arguing over whether Barney should appear, and they made it seem like Barney was you know a combination of Elvis and uh, a NASA spacesuit that couldn't, you know, the technology of which could not be shown in public. So their last argument was, or their last point to the judge was, and plus, Your Honor, it, the the costume uh, Barney is is unwieldy to be in this courtroom. It is six foot eight inches tall, and it weighs uh, uh, two hundred and eighty pounds, and so it, it can't get getting in and out of the courtroom. It's just impractical. And I stood up and said, Your Honor, I'm 6'8", and I weigh about 235, and I got in here just fine. And, and the judge ordered Barney to the trial right there. And so after, you know, and I, 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 I was just doing that to, you know, to really piss them off. Good and, job. And, it, it, well, it almost backfired on me because when, they, when Barney came to the trial, it didn't come into the courtroom. It, it, they had a truck that they backed up to the loading dock at the at the federal courthouse and barney just pops out of the back you know just like it was doing a show and everybody at the courthouse every employee was down there and a lot of them had brought their kids so i was like i don't know that this was the best thing uh this might have been i might have got this turned around on me but we ultimately won so it worked out that's fantastic i've never heard you tell that before that's awesome uh that's really great um Aside from Barney, you've worked with some other fun characters. Uh, Digger Phelps, Bill Raftery, Bob Knight. Maybe not so much fun, but definitely a character, Bob Knight. I'm not going to ask you to rank them, but what was it like working with, with guys like that, Digger and, and Raff and, and, and Coach Knight? A joy, um, you know, and, and all very different. So, uh, you know, Raft is, as you know, maybe the most fun, genuine person I've ever met. And he taught me a lot about, about the business, not just, you know, the nuts and bolts of it and the style of it, but Raftery doesn't just love basketball. He loves, he loves the game, but more than that, he loves the people in the game. Mm -hmm. And so every game, we would always go in and see the coaches before the game. And I, had, I, I don't do that with anybody else. It, it, unless the coach wants to see you, you couldn't go to practice the day before, they close their practice, whatever. Um, I always felt like, you know, right before the game, they don't want to be bothered by us. That, that never worked for Raftery. He, he would always walk in. He'd, he'd barge in on Bayheim right before the game when Jim's sitting in the back watching television by himself. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he would always say something that would make everybody laugh. Um, uh, and, and there were times when he'd go back and see the trainer because his, his knee was hurting or something and, you know, just crazy stuff like that. And, uh, and it, we always had a blast together. So especially when it was Raft, me and McDonough, right. um, that, that was probably the most fun, uh, I've ever had professionally. Um, this, those guys made everything fun and Digger was, a uh, and I mean this in the best possible way. Like he, he was, he was the sideshow. Um, you know, you, you never, and he could take a joke and he could, he could dish it out. Um, but everywhere we went, uh, uh, Digger would, you know, you, he'd make you laugh. Um, just, just great to be around, especially if you, you saw him at Notre Dame, cause you could really, uh, he could really take a joke. And the night was a, a, a force I've never dealt with before, uh, before or since, um, we, we used to do games together in addition to studio stuff. So we had a game at Kansas one time and, and night uh, coach Knight says to me, uh, Hey, let's go get something to eat before the game. And I was like, well, the game starts at one. Um, like you want to have breakfast before the game? And he goes, no, no, let's go grab a bite to eat right before the game. And I'm thinking like grab a sandwich on the way to the game. And, and he's like, no, uh, we went to an Applebee's in Lawrence, Kansas. The game's at one. We sat down at like 1215. And, and there are all kinds of fans in there that were going to the game looking at us like, what are you guys doing here? And I, I remember calling our producer saying, you won't believe this, but uh, Coach Knight wants to have lunch. And, he, and the, I remember him saying to me, he says, well, can you be here by tip? 
<laughs> and I go, I'm pretty <laughs> sure I can. So we got there. We, we got there five minutes before the game tipped off and, uh, and did great. I mean, it was no problem. But it was really a, a scary feeling for me because I had, I'm always there an hour and a half before, two hours before. And uh, I had never cut it that close. Uh, but, you know, when you're with Bob Knight, you just do what you go with, with his flow, and it always seems to work out. I'm a lot more like you than I than I am, Coach Knight. I have to be there early. I, I get a migraine if I'm if I'm not there at least an hour ahead of time. My coworkers can tell you uh, my my anxiety. I got to work on it. Uh, speaking of work, you on Twitter almost every morning something comes out of the Jay Billis Twitter feed, and it ends with the phrase, "I got to go to work." And usually it's, it's like a song lyric, a rap lyric or something, and it ends with, I got to go to work. What's the background there? Where did that start? Yeah, we just lost power here, but I still have, uh, uh, it's, off my, it's going off my uh, phone's internet. So about 2010, um, we were doing game day at Michigan State. And Draymond Green is wearing these big old headphones. And I think, I can't remember if it was Reese Dave, but I think Reese Davis asked him, what are you listening to? And he said, I'm listening to Young Jeezy. And so Hubert Davis was, was working with us at the time before he went back as an assistant with North Carolina. And he turns to me and he says, is that on your I, iPod at the time was a big deal. He says, is that on your iPod? And I said, actually, it is. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so we started kind of laughing about that because, you know, he didn't think I was the type of, of personality that might listen to uh, so somehow that had come out on the air. I don't know. I don't think we were on the air, but maybe we were. And uh, so on Twitter, I start getting hit with, come on, man, you don't really listen to Jeezy. And, and so I went back and forth with some people on Twitter just on Jeezy lyrics from at the time it was, it was called TM 101 was one of the albums. And so I, I went back and forth and, uh, and somehow, you know, it's become like a, like a, I don't even know if this is true anymore, but I remember like at the, at the end of going back and forth, I, I couldn't keep doing that because I, I had to go into my office. So I put down, I, you know, I, I got to go to work and somehow it caught on. I, and so I started doing it every, every morning and then it became an expectation. Uh, this isn't the only thing I listen to and Jeezy's not the only thing I listen to. Um, but, um, uh, uh, but it's been really fun. Like I listened to all kinds of music when I was in high school, about the same time the white shadows going on, there was a, there was a group called the sugar Hill gang that came out with rappers to light. And my, my buddies and I loved that. I mean, we knew every word to it still do. I mean, we probably sang that song in practice every single day for two years. Uh, so that, that's sort of where it came from and, and whatever appreciation I have for the, for the art form started there. That's really cool. Well, we've had a lot of fun and, and some of these topics are great and I hope everyone listening has enjoyed them, but I got to ask you one or two serious questions. You know, we started off asking each other how we're doing when, when, you know, with the coronavirus and, you know, we're kind of all hanging out at home and hoping for college basketball. What kind of chances do you give that we're going to have a full college basketball season. It ends with a tournament. And what do you think is necessary in order to get there? Well, full season in the traditional sense, I think there's a 0% chance of that. But do we have a recognized, um, you know, schedule like where you can complete, you know, 20 some games, maybe uh, have some disruptions, maybe a bumpy ride and then get to get to a, a championship event. Uh, I, I think it's probably in, in you know in, in the 75, 80 percent range of getting that done. The 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 when this all uh, started, when we were having the argument about football, uh, is football going to go forward? You remember when Kirk Herbstreit made an offhand comment during a show over the summer where he said, you know, I, I I'd be surprised we have a football season. He got blasted for that. I mean, he was right in what he said, and and people just didn't want to hear it. I, I thought that we were going to have football for a variety that basketball is the, is the most likely to be compromised because it's a uh, longer um, season, uh, more games, more travel, all indoors, and it's got all kinds of potholes for that. Sure. Um, I'm still hopeful we'll get it done, but clearly we're not going to have a normal 
uh, non-conference season. So it's going to, the negative impact of this is going to be far reaching. Uh, I'm just hopeful that we don't lose our resolve and we can, we can get through this and have the season. Cause there are a lot of people that are, are really nervous that if we go two years in a row without a, an NCAA tournament, that college basketball could be damaged significantly going forward. I don't share those concerns. Um, I don't think it'll be damaged. I think we'll, we'll be able to get back on the horse and ride. Uh, uh, but um, it, it, I mean, it's starting to, because of the numbers shooting up in the Midwest and Northeast to levels we've not seen during the pandemic yet, it's starting to, it's starting to get a little bit scary that, that, um, you know, like, for example, they're threatening, uh, uh, the mayor of Denver threatened to shut down a couple days ago. Uh, Wisconsin is borderline out of control. Uh, so what happens if, if some of these states start to say, no, nope, we're going to have to go to stay at home orders. You know, if you have a stay at home order, you're not going to be scheduled a basketball game. I know that. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to start impacting things. And I just, if we can get through football, I think basketball uh, has, a, has a decent chance of, of having a season. And the other topic before we close is uh, some of the issues that the NCAA has been, choose your verb, grappling with, trying to avoid as best they can. Uh, <laughs> uh, in terms of name, image, and likeness for athletes, um, you know, athlete, you know, compensation. You know, I'm old enough to remember when, man, the scholarship was going to be good enough. And it seems like they're starting to give on a few areas. But um, where, where do you think the NCAA needs to be? And do you think they're moving there with, with any realism? Are, are they going there? Or are, they, are, we, are we trying to, or are they placating people right now? It's a little bit of both. I mean, you know, there are a lot of there are a lot of younger administrators that see this as being inevitable that we've we've created this uh, this multi billion dollar business and did so intentionally. Uh, so this is ultimately where we have to wind up, where players can be compensated, where the transfer rules are more liberal, uh, things like that. Uh, you know, the older guard is honestly just trying to retire before this changes uh, because they don't see it this way. Um, you know, they think that, that all that they have done to, you know, enrich the schools, enrich themselves. And I don't mean that negatively, but enrich coaches and all that. But that's all okay. And, and they've rationalized it to the point where they say, well, the players are compensated. They get a scholarship. They are paid. They're paid stipend. They can even get a Pell Grant from the government if they qualify. So they are paid which sort of then you start asking the question about, well, how many, how many non-athletes are on scholarship? Um, Cause there are a, a significant amount that are on scholarship, whether it's a music scholarship or uh, journalism, whatever, there are all kinds of scholarships that are given out and quote unquote, you know, full rides. Um, so how do we characterize that? Are they paid? Are they compensated? And if they're compensated for what? Um, the answer is those are educational opportunities. And, and so they're provided with the same things that basketball and football players and others are provided with, but there's no restriction on them. So they can earn or accept whatever they choose in the marketplace and they can transfer whenever they want and participate in whatever extracurricular activity they want um, uh, as long as it's not uh, a sport. Um, so there, there are all kinds of contradictions in the system. And I think the best thing is to uh, open it up and let everyone have full economic rights, just like all athletes, just like literally everyone else has. And oftentimes, Mike, you hear the term choice, like athletes have a choice. You don't have to, you don't have to play sports. <laughs> and I think that's a false choice. Uh, what I would say is the schools are the ones with the choice. Like you don't have to pay if you don't want to, but uh, a blanket restriction industry-wide that nobody can do it is profoundly wrong in my judgment. And then the other part of it is, what about the choice of, of, of the schools in that, hey, if you don't wanna participate in big time college sports, nobody, myself included, is complaining about, the, uh, about div how division three operates. Mm -hmm. So if, if Syracuse, because this is a Syracuse podcast, if Syracuse decides, you know what, we're not comfortable with this, so we're gonna play division three. You know, that'd be great. That's a choice. So make that choice and have the right, if you think that's the right balance, why don't you, why don't you make the sacrifice instead of asking the athletes to do it? So we'll have Amherst come in and play Syracuse in the Carrier Dome 
and it's free admission, you know, no TV, um, because that, that wouldn't comport with our, you know, our uh, mission statement. So, uh, yeah, we'll go division three. It'd be great. Um, I know they're not going to do that because Syracuse, Ohio state, Duke, they're not giving up all this money and institutional advancement that comes with college sports. They're just not doing it. And, uh, and so look, do I object to the NCAA running to Congress and asking for an antitrust exemption or running to Congress and saying, please, please pass uh, legislation that would preempt all these states uh, that are that are passing legislation. I do object to that. I object to them taking the players' money and lobbying Congress. Uh, I don't think that's appropriate at all. But that's the world we're living in now. And but but to, to your original question, we're the NCAA and the member schools are essentially being forced into this. Right. And uh, you know all the different state legislatures that have passed, they're being forced into it, and they're being forced into changing the transfer rules because the transfer rules have been so bad for so many years, it is painfully obvious they need to change. And if they don't change, um, they're gonna, it's gonna compromise their ability to, to put up guardrails on name of likeness. Like you can't have it both ways. You can't say you don't get any money for the love of the game and your students to be treated like any other student. Uh, but by the way, you can't leave because you're also assets of the university that bring the university uh, the chance to make uh, millions upon millions of dollars and the industry to make billions of dollars. Th th those things don't don't work together, and and they, they've realized that, and, and they're they're taking steps to change it. Well, it's interesting. It's 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 definitely a, a, a changing times in, in the college uh, sports landscape. Uh, this was Jay Billis joining us here on the Basketball Pod. He is one of the leading voices in, in college athletics, the conscience of the NCAA, a former intergalactic alien cop, and the guy that took down Barney the dinosaur in a court of law. Jay, this was awesome. That was great for me. If, and if any of your, your listeners have a uh, cartoon character that is coming after them for unreasonable demands, uh, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to represent you. So give me a call put out your shingle and uh, I'll direct them your way. That's fantastic. Jay, listen, I can't thank you enough. 